Okay, it's about one minute after the hour. So because we have a 30 minute program, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get things started. My name is Jason Williams and I'm an assistant director here at the DNA Learning Center, welcome. Uh, this is the second of a monthly series uh, that we're gonna continue throughout the school year. And uh, hopefully we also do next year as well, called a Meet a Scientist. And we're very uh, privileged to have uh, Dr. Camilo Dos Santos, who I'll be introducing in a moment, who's going to be our second speaker. Uh, before we do that, I just wanna make you aware of some things. So I'm gonna share my screen and uh, just uh, bring you to the Learning Center website, just to make sure that we're kind of all on the same page. So hopefully uh, you have visited uh, the DNA Learning Center website, maybe even recently, maybe that's how you heard about us. And I'll draw your attention to the fall, which will soon be a spring uh, 2020 programs where there are a variety of um, uh, things that we're doing differently this year, of course. Uh, and that includes a lot of virtual field trips, uh, many of those which include experiences that are hands on. And so if you're interested in those things, as well as our science clubs or anytime camps, uh, please go to find out a little bit more about what's going on there, uh, because we've been thinking of ways uh, to make sure that we're still reaching uh, all of our students and teachers, and we encourage you to share that. Uh, here we are in the Meet a Scientist series, and uh, of course, we have Dr. DeSantis, and there's a little bit of an introduction to, hear, uh, to her talk, which is going to be the impact of pregnancy on breast cancer risk. And she's also uh, graciously uh, included a little bit of her story about what is it like to be a scientist for her? How did she uh, get involved in this? Because also part of the point is to hopefully inspire students to think about and see themselves in this career. And we're gonna ask you to join us again in January and then also in February. So in January, we'll have Dr. Lloyd Treitman, who is a prostate cancer research here at the lab and also uh, Dr. I call him Tony, Tony Zader, <laughs> who is a neuroscientist is doing fantastic things with neuroscience and artificial intelligence. Um, last reminder is that, well, two reminders. One, we have a question and answer feature. So please go ahead and ask your questions at any time. Uh, Camila, I will call those out to you or we'll make sure at the end which is usually when we see the most questions, we go ahead and attend to those questions, but we do love to hear your questions. And um, this will be posted later on to YouTube. Uh, one of the reasons we do these talks is it's full of fascinating information. So we hope you share those uh, recordings with your uh, family and friends. So with that said, I am going to uh, give it to you, Dr. DeSantis, uh, to say a little bit more about your research and give everyone a chance to meet a scientist. So Dr. DeSantis, uh, everything, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much, Jason, for this introduction and uh, hello, everyone. Um, I understand that you probably are tired of staring at a computer or doing Zooms for your classrooms. Um, and I, I promise that I, you know, I try to put something that brings some of a perspective that what made me wanted to be a scientist. Uh, but also what we do here in the lab. So I'm going to be start sharing my screen with you guys. All right, I'm just gonna get laser point. There we go. Um, so what I wanted to talk to you today about is the impact of pregnancy on breast cancer risk. But as I mentioned before, and as also Jason mentioned before, um, I wanted to you know give you a little you know, background about where I come from and how do I become, became interested in science. So I'm originally from Brazil. Uh, Brazil is the largest country in, uh, on, in Latin America. It's, it's placed on, um, on South America. And I, um, American MCR, and I come from a city called Campinas which is inside of Sao Paulo state. Sao Paulo is one of the uh, industrial big cities um, in, in Brazil. Uh, we tend to play a joke that Sao Paulo is the uh, Brazilian New York, just because it's full of buildings, a lot of traffic, um, but also a very fun place to live. So I am the oldest of three siblings uh, and here uh, are my 
my brother and my sister and my parents, they all live in Brazil. So all, so all my family, um, they are still in Brazil. So as you guys can imagine, I wasn't able to visit them this year because of COVID, uh, but thankful to FaceTime and WhatsApp, we keep in touch. Um, um, and, you know, of course that um, I'm here because I've started my whole, whole family here in New York, in the US and I have my work, but I miss them dearly and I cannot wait to see them. Um, I'm the only scientist of the house, which means that for many, many years when I was an undergraduate, ev um, everything that would happen that was crazy around the house, they would blame on me. Um, and even though I'm not at home anymore, they still blame on me when crazy things happen. So. Um, They've always thought that I have a different perspective in life um, other than because they're business and um, oriented uh, kind of in terms of their profession. Now, a little bit of my education. Uh, I got my undergraduate degree in general biology. And that means that I studied everything biology associated botanics, zoology, anatomy, histology, cytology, um, geology. Um, so it was a very complete biology background. Um, and to be honest, I fell in love with every single aspect of it. Um, and when I finished my undergrad, I was still unsure of what I wanted to do. I was really drawn to um, studying model systems like plants, like animals, and looking at cells. So um, during about two years, I work as a research lab technician at University of Sao Paulo. Again, it's a big University of Sao Paulo. And uh, during that time, I kind of figured that I wanted to uh, become more involved with science. And I decided that I wanted to go into a graduate program, which back then, many, many years ago, um, the trajectory was you get your master's degree first, and then you get your PhD first. So I got both of my master and my PhD degrees at the University of Campinas. So this is the biggest university in my hometown. Uh, and I was under the supervision of Dr. Uh, Fernando Costa. And in his laboratory, I started understanding what are the differences in genes activation uh, what we call gene expression and in uh, during red blood cell development. So red blood cell is the cell in our body that carries on oxygen throughout our whole body. There are a series of diseases that um, impact those cells such as sickle cell anemia and beta thalassemia. And my master's and PhD program uh, project was to understand the development of those cells. And the goal here was, was to understand normal developed so well that we could perhaps revert those uh, syndromes like, such as sickle cell anemia thalassemia to improve uh, the lifestyle of patients that carry on those diseases. And you're gonna see a trend with thinking of normal development and um, carrying that on to disease up to the, today what I do in my lab. When I was in my second year of my PhD, training, uh, my mentor uh, brought my work to a international conference here in the US. I couldn't come because we didn't have the funds to support students to go travel abroad. And at that meeting, uh, my PhD mentor, he met Mitch Weiss. Uh, Mitch Weiss had a laboratory at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. CHOP associated with UPenn and Mitch invite, um, invited me to come and spend a year uh, of my PhD in his laboratory, kind of focusing, uh, continue to focus on normal, bl normal um, blood development, but on a specific protein uh, that could be helpful to improve beta thalassemia outcome in patients as well. So that's why I came to the Children's Hospital of, of Philadelphia in 2005. Um, I stayed here until, I still need to, uh, I went back in 2006 to Brazil to graduate. And in 2007, I came back to Children's Hospital of Philadelphia to do a short postdoc. 
And uh, during the postdoc, I studied microRNAs, which again are, are li little pieces of um, RNA, which is made of DNA, that also control normal development. Um, at the end of 2008, I wanted to change what I was studying, right? So I was studying blood development since my master's program. So I started looking for positions that would allow me to continue to understand gene regulation, but in another system. And that's how I came to Cold Spring Harbor, November of 2008, uh, to study breast stem cells. And the idea here too, was to bring in my knowledge of gene regulation into understanding um, how breast stem cells work and what are the implications in cancer. Um, I moved here with my husband. My husband, Chris here, he's also a scientist here at the lab. He also has a research lab here. And we now have two children. Uh, they're gonna kill me if they see the kind of picture that I choose to show from them. But this picture really, you know, captured their, their nature. Um, um, our kids go to Cold Spring Harbor School District. So um, they were gonna be in high school around here soon, hopefully. Um, and that is Shushan, our pandemic little dog. So we all live here at the lab and um, we breathe and we live science and we could be more grateful to be in such an enriching environment um, for our kids and for ourselves as we have. My lab is located on the second floor of the McClintock building, which is a pretty amazing place to be at. This building was named after Barbara McClintock. Barbara McClintock uh, was here at Cold Spring Harbor many years ago, and she ended up winning a Nobel Prize for understanding jumping genes. Those are pieces of DNA that, um, that she studied in uh, corn, in maize, and she showed that actually, the, and the way that those gene jumps is that it, what it gives the different colors uh, to the care of, of corn. So she's an amazing scientist, an amazing example of women in science. Um, funny fact, I not only work at the McClintock Building Laboratory, but I also live at the building where Barbara McClintock used to live. So I have big shoes to fill in here, and I'm for sure uh, her, her, one of her biggest fans. Um, here at the lab, in my laboratory, we study how pregnancy induces breast development. Breast is a very interesting organ because by the time that we are born, men and women, boys and girls, they have the same breast tissue. You know, it's a rudimentary breast tissue. And as we go through puberty, women go through puberty, the hormones associated with puberty actually speaks to those cells in the breast and allow the tissue to develop. And that's what I'm showing here in this scheme. So in response to the signals of puberty, this branching, and I'm making an analogy here with the uh, fall and uh, the, with, with the seasons. So this is uh, early spring with in response to rain, the, the flowers and the leaves start coming back on the trees. That's what happens to the breast in response to pregnancy hormones. Um, and then during pregnancy, in, for example, in, in the summer, where all the signals are all the, where, where, when all the environment is making everything um, suitable for cells to develop, the breast really exists breast cells really expand and form duct structures that really resemble uh, flower looking stru um, structures. During lactation, those cells stop growing, but instead now they start producing milk. So they turn into mini milk factories. And the main goal here is to produce milk that will support the offspring. When the offspring stop nursing, milk stop being produced and all the cells that produce milk, they are removed from the tissue. They die and they are removed from the tissue resembling what we go through, um, what are we actually going through now, which is the end of, um, of the fall. Um, 
to be a bit more specific about how that really looks in terms of tissue. So what I'm showing here are images from a mouse tissue, a breast tissue, which shows um, how the breast structure are, is in the animal that just became adult. Um, what we have here then is the breast structure when, during pregnancy, this is 12 days post conception and 18 days post conception and just means different stages of the baby development. And those during those stages, signals present uh, in, uh, in, in those individuals um, induce those flower-like structures to expand and to grow. This is how they look like from a different um, view. After the offspring is born and during lactation, those uh, the, the breast tissue pretty much take on the whole uh, fat uh, adipocyte tissue of the gland and it become hollow. And it becomes hollow because now it's, it's full of lipid droplets that are gonna be part of the milk that will be given to the offspring. Each one of those developmental stages, each one of those stages of breast tissue development are controlled by an epigenetic regulation of gene expression. And this is just a big name to say that some genes, they get turned on during that developmental stage, such as the genes that control growth, they get turned on in response to pregnancy signals, and some genes they get turned off as well, such as during lactation, the genes that induce growth, they get turned off, so then the genes that produce milk, they can get, they can get turned on. And we are really, understand, really keen to understand what are the molecular switches that turn those genes back on and off, and if we can understand that, we can understand how improve milk production in, in those individuals that have uh, that, that have difficulties producing milk, but also we can understand breast cancer, and I will get to that very soon. Um, at that point, I was studying breast stem cells, and at that point that I that 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 I joined the lab in two thousand thirteen, that's when I you know was around the time that I was having my second child, and there was an overwhelming amount of information suggesting that nursing is more efficient with the second child. There are a lot of blogs, you guys know that nowadays that's how a lot of us communicate via blogs, suggesting that it's just easier to nurse a child during the second pregnancy because the mom knows what to do better. Uh, but what actually what my study showed is that breast cells remember what it is to be pregnant. So what I'm showing here in the top is the image of a breast tissue from a mouse experience its first pregnancy. So you can see the little branch structures that I demonstrated before and the little uh, uh, flower-like structures here at the end. What I'm showing here in the bottom is a, is a tissue from a mouse that is actually experiencing a second pregnancy cycle. And we see that there are many more of those flower-like structures in this tissue. And to begin with, they were look, they, those tissues look very similar. What is suggested that um, there were switches that were left on in breast cells after the first pregnancy, that they become on more quickly in the second pregnancy. And in the way that I would like you to think about that is about, uh, you know, sometimes when you go um, instead of switching on and off the light, you have the dimmer. So you can dim the light on and dim the light off. So this is what we think that it believed after the first pregnancy where everything got turned on. Uh, the, some genes, they become just dim instead of becoming off. Therefore, when the sig signals of a second pregnancy are in place, it's just much faster for them to go to full on than they were of, of, in the first pregnancy cycle. We have now, in, in, in our, this is all, this, all of this study that I just showed to you was done in, in, in vivo, but we wanted to develop strategies that we can study that in a dish. And the reason for that is because it can allow us to manipulate genes, to manipulate the main switch, and then ask, can a cell make milk if we remove a certain gene from their genome? And for that, we are using a, a, a 
strategy that is called 3D organoid cultures. Those are um, cultures that we can grow from tissue fragments. And we can actually, here in my lab, do it from a mouse memory tissue. We can fragment the tissue and put it in a three-dimensional um, dome. And they will just develop very similar to how the tissue would develop in a mouse. But we can also do that with human tissue. And it allows us to understand milk production from an evolutionary, evolutionary perspective. Just to show you how this works. So what I'm showing here a little of pictures of breast, of mouse breast organoids. And I want you to focus here on those uh, red squares. Here I'm showing uh, mammary organoids that were experiencing the first exposure to pregnancy signals. And you can see that they start forming those little um, buds, which we call branches. And uh, with longer time, those branches increase. But what was really interesting to see was that if we then grow memory tissue from a mouse that has been previously exposed to pregnancy, those branching structures, they come up much sooner um, than in the one that experienced in the first pregnancy. Really suggesting that there's uh, cell intrinsic mechanisms, switches inside of the cells that are controlling genes from inside of those cells that respond more robustly to the signal, the pregnancy signals. We also show that in those conditions, we can make those mouse organoids to make milk. In green here, what we have is a staining that is coloring green, a specific protein that is part of milk in the mouse um, memory tissue here. And what we are showing here is that we can induce the tissue from never pregnant female mice to make milk in the organic culture. But if we then do the same experiment with tissue from a mouse that has been a pregnancy before, milk production is enhanced. Really supporting all the studies that we did before and now open up an opportunity that we can better understand the mechanism of this switching on and off. Most importantly, as I mentioned before, we can now utilize this strategy to understand uh, human development. And what I'm showing here to you uh, is the progression of branching morphogenesis, which is this ability to come with those buds from memory uh, organoid cultures that were derived from a human. And not only we can induce this organoid from being totally spherical to have all those three-dimensional structures, but we can make them make milk too. And this is what we're showing here in green here again, where we stay in green a protein that is present in, in milk. Now, why do we want to do that? And how can we understand those switches? So um, I'm sure that you guys have studied uh, or heard of CRISPR-Cas9, this new strategy that allows us scientists with um, molecular scissors that we can go into a cell and remove a piece of DNA and study what are the effects on cellular behavior when we remove the DNA out. And this is what we are investing, not only from the mouse perspective, but for the human perspective. And we are also using the same system to, in, to introduce new genes that and uh, ask the question, are those genes, do those genes make better, um, in, in more robust milk production? Those strategies are very important because it, get, it takes me to the second part, to, to a second part of what I want to talk to you guys about, which is to understand how pregnancy in, uh, affects uh, cancer development. And pregnancy in, uh, can affect breast cancer development in many different ways. And the way that my lab studies is how women that are pregnant very early in their life have a decrease on their risk to develop breast cancer. That is a decrease in the risk to develop breast cancer that has uh, a genetic basis that you inherit through your DNA, but it's also a decrease in the risk from developed cancer that is spontaneously developed. So it's a very strong risk, it's a 30 to 40% drop on the risk. And we are, we are very interested to understand that because that could we can translate that into a preventive strategy to block cancer development, even in women that were never pregnant before. And again, what we are looking here is about this epigenetic regulation. Given that pregnancies 
change how those switches are on and off for milk production, we hypothesized that different switches could be also modulated by pregnancy and changing how cancer genes get turned on and drive cancer development. And we come from the perspective here again that we wanted to understand what happens in normal breast cells first. So then we can then understand what is the impact of those chains and to develop of many different types of subtypes of, of breast cancer from the more um, frequent ones to the more uh, aggressive ones. And we use mouse models, mostly mouse models to understand that. And here I'm just showing you a very simplistic scheme on how we actually can introduce foreign DNA to germ cells from a mouse from, to a developing embryo of a mouse. So then we can establish transgenic mouse lines that better resemble um, the human breast cancer develop and it would allow us to understand the effect of pregnancy on them. So we developed this mouse model in which we, are, uh, we put additional copies of the gene MIC. MIC is the bad guy of, of, of cells, a lot of MIC, often results into cancer and not only breast, but other kinds of cancer. And using this system, what we learn is that in the mouse that has never been pregnant, that carry on a lot of this gene, you have the, we observe the development of malignant lesions. This is the early stages of cancer development. The cases that when a woman goes to do a mammogram, that's what she sees. However, when we look at the tissue from a mouse that has been pregnant before, we see a very normal breast tissue, suggesting that pregnancy blocks how many copies of the gene MIC would induce cancer development in a mouse breast. What we learned from that, to make a long story short, we learned that MIC when it's activated in post-pregnancy cells, induce a program that is called senescence. And senescence is a stage that the cells are a little quiet, but at the same time, they are secreting information to the other cells surrounding them. And that information can induce immune cells, the gardens of your body to attack them and prevent them from turning to cancer, for example. And those are the genes that we see that are different to that. That poses us the question, you know, we have been focusing so much on those different, on breast cells for so long. And maybe there we are missing the link between pregnancy and prevention because we are not expanding our field, uh, field of vision to the, all the other cells that we have in the breast. So how once did that? It's too many cells. So we, take on a strategy that is called single cell analysis. That is a pretty cool strategy that allows you to get one cell and look at every single RNA that is made in the cell. And for those of you that do not know what RNA is, so DNA molecules get made into DNA, into RNA molecules, and those RNA molecules are gonna be the template for the cells to make protein. So we employ that strategy and this is, each one of those dots here is a different cell type and they are grouped together to the cell types that are more closely associated with. Using that analysis, we define clusters of cells that represent immune cells in the, in the breast, but also we found cluster of cells that represent the breast cells in the breast tissue. Again, to make a long story short, one of the things that we found that was the most interesting so far is that there were certain types of immune cells in the breast of mouse that has been going through pregnancy, those cells here, that every time that we found those cells in the breast tissue, there was no cancer, the tissue was normal. So what I'm showing here to you is a strategy that is called flow cytometry. So you know when you go to the doctor and your doctor wants to see your blood counts, that is a very similar strategy that allows the doctors to identify different blood cells in your bloodstream. We can apply that to identify different blood, uh, different cells in the breast as well. It, because we have the ability to engineer mice, 
we identify genes in those cells that when we remove from a mouse, those cells disappear. And every time that those cells disappears, there is the cancer develops, even in a tissue from a post-pregnancy female mouse. And how do they look? They look like this. So very abnormal tissue. You see, if you look at here, you see normal tissue, but here you have abnormal tissue. So this is the early stages of breast cancer de developing mice, and it will develop when we remove those cells. Why we are so excited about that? It's because now we can think of vaccination, right? We are talking a lot about COVID vaccination nowadays. We can think that if we identifying these genes that are present in breast cells after pregnancy and how those genes are sent as a way to communicate with the immune cells, we could provide this communication instead of pregnancy, activate immune cells so then they would prevent cancer from developing. This is something that we are very um, heavily studying the lab right now. Why do we wanted to do that? So I told you that we've been doing that with Mick, but one of the things that we wanted to start studying is BRCA. BRCA is a gene that we all have in our body, but when this gene is mutated, when this gene is abnormal, it's associated with increased breast cancer risk. So using the technology that I showed you before, we develop a mouse model that we can resemble what happens in humans. We can remove a piece of the gene BRCA from the mouse and then follow tumor development. And those, what I'm showing here are histology, breast tissue from mouse at different um, time points of tumor development. And we can, now we are very interested to apply our vaccination system to those mice to prevent cancers that are have the same genetic background that the ones that develop in humans. We also believe that that could be not only a good strategy to prevent the primary tumor, the ones that grows in the breast, but to prevent metastatic disease. Those cells that get released from the breast, they go into circulation and they could colonize the lungs and the brain and develop as cancers there too, which are very hard to treat. And with that, I hope that you enjoy learning about breast development, which is something that we study a lot, and our strategies in understanding normal breast development and how we can learn for normal to target breast cancer. And um, this is the beautiful people that I have in my lab that um, are the ones that contributed to all this beautiful work, and I uh, will be happy to take questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So I'd like to invite uh, people, uh, thank you for our attendees for coming, to ask some questions in the Q&A uh, that is uh, available to you, and we will try to answer those questions. It can be about the science, it could be about Dr. DeSantis, uh, maybe the history of, of, of her uh, scientific career, anything that you'd like. Maybe I can start with a question, which is, you mentioned a couple of times this word organoids. Uh-huh. And... Um, could you help us to understand what is an organoid and maybe, you know, why, why is that different than studying maybe some breast cancer cells on a Petri dish, just, you know, a few cells? How does that matter? What, what is that? Right. No, that's a great question. And to address your question, I'm going to put again um, this light. So this image here, it's from an organoid. So, um, an organoid, it's, it's like it's a mini organ. That's the orange of the word. It's a mini organ. And uh, different from the cells that we go in the Petri dish, that they go in a two-dimensional kind of space, every single um, uh, organ in our body, they go in a three-dimensional. So you have cells have contact with each other from many different angles, which we cannot mimic when we do a 2D organoid. What does that mean when we go a two-dimensional uh, Petri dish growth? What that means is that the cells uh, send signals to each other in a different way when they are you know, attached to each other by many different angles from when they are attached to each other like that in the 2D. So um, in a way that we process the cells, for example, from a mouse, you harvest the breast tissue from a mouse and you fragment, you cut into little pieces 
And then you put those pieces to grow inside of a matrix that resemble the matrix that we have in our normal breast. So in addition to have breast cells uh, in the breast, you have immune cells and you have fibroblasts and we have uh, fibers that keep the cells kind of in this three-dimensional structure that provide stiffness that is also important for the cells to grow. And by putting the cells there, they're gonna go with those different cell interactions as I'm showing here. So they can grow a little oval, they can grow a little elongated, they can have hollows, uh, you know, um, they can be, they, they, can, they, they, they can create those little hollow pieces in the middle um, and really resembles how those cells grow in a, in a, in a tissue in our body. So from a, a, an idea to understand breast cancer and normal tissue, organites have been proven to be um, very powerful. Okay, and I have one more question, but again, if there are any questions from the audience, uh, now's your chance to ask them. Uh, my question was about, you showed that really interesting slide with uh, the prevalence of cancer depending upon the, birth, uh, the age at which somebody got pregnant. Mm -hmm. and I'm curious because I'm assuming that that's from an average of you know people who on average got pregnant at age 25 or 35 or whatever. But I'm curious, uh, has anybody looked carefully or closely at, or just in general, since I don't know the answer, um, in pregnancy, I imagine there's a whole bunch of hormonal responses that happen during the pregnancy. And are some women, do they have more hormonal responses or lower levels of hormones? Do we know in any detail? Are those pregnancies the same? Or even, you know, maybe the hormone response is different at one age and, and, and not as not the same at a different age. Do we know any more details about how hormones um, in the course of pregnancy change and how that might affect what we're seeing there? Right, no, this is a very good question. I, you know, I, I wanted to start with uh, hormonal levels across different individuals first, because this, this is why puberty uh, allows us to develop in different ways, right? You know, you, you know, some some kids they hit puberty when they are thirteen. Some kids they hit puberty when they are fifteen. You know, like you know the the the, the growth, um, the, the 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 maturation of organs. Um, in the case of females, that's when um, we start developing breasts. In the case of men, that's when it's, you know you start building up more muscles. So there are variations for the level of hormones across individuals. We do not have the same levels of hormones as we go through, when we go through puberty across individuals to the same extent that we do not go through, um, pregnant women do not have, you know, X number of, of, of pregnancy hormones in their circulation. It's an increase above the normal that that person has, mm -hmm. right? Um, now, studies, the studies have that, that being, it, and, and another uh, point too, as we age, the hormone kind of uh, drifts away, the, the hormonal level drops. And that's why women go through menopause. And that's why men go through andropause because those hormones that sustain, that were brought by, by, by puberty, they disappear. Not disappear, they tone it down. Um, there haven't been, to my knowledge at least, studies that have associated the levels of pregnancy the levels of hormones during pregnancy with breast cancer risk, but there are studies that have shown um, the length, how many months a woman has to be pregnant to, uh, ben to benefit from the preventive effects that pregnancy has on breast cancer development. So pregnancy it generally it's, a four, it's about 40 to 42 weeks, some less, you know, but 42 is the goal. Uh, and studies shown that a woman has to be pregnant for 34 weeks to, uh, uh, to benefit from the preventive uh, effects of pregnancy. So, it's so, a so there, is a, there is a question actually that's very related uh, to uh -huh. that. I'm going to ask it and let you continue what you were saying because right. in case it adds anything, one of the questions from the audience is if a woman has a miscarriage, does that also raise her chances to develop breast cancer? I say, is I think that is that where we're going right now with this? 
Right. No, well, that's a very good, good uh, important question. So this little bump that I'm showing here shows the risk of having bre uh, breast cancer right after pregnancy ends, right? Which is some ends with miscarriages and some ends with birth. So pregnancy by itself increases the risk of breast cancer. Um, in, ca in cases of uh, uh, rare uh, miscarriages, there's, there's no strong association being made, but repetitive miscarriages can play a role on increasing the chance. And it's because, you know, there's a lot of tissue growth and tissue retraction without uh, the length of exposure to pregnancy hormones that would be beneficial in that age dependent manner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another question um, we have, we'll answer, we'll ask this question. And then if there's one more, we have time for just one more. Okay. Uh, otherwise this might be the last one. Uh, so the question is, um, can, can some of the techniques, I'm gonna rephrase the question a little bit, but the techniques uh, that you are uh, using to study these cancers, do they apply to other parts of the body? So perhaps other cancers, I'm, obviously the breast tissue is special because it's something that is sort of there, but then becomes activated, I guess, in a sense by pregnancy. But do some of these approaches or things, uh, these questions apply uh, to other cancers? Right, so the, tech, the organoid technique is being widely used uh, to understand many different, uh, the, the normal development of many different organs, but also cancer development. So for example, here at the lab, we have uh, Dave Tubson that he studies pancreatic cancer, and he has developed a series of organoids that um, really mimic what's happening in humans because in his case, he's a clinician. He can do side-by-side -side tissue comparisons. Um, we have Samir Bayaz and he has uh, uh, endometrial organoids. So uh, as far as, you know, uh, the, the media that you grow those organoids with is not the same for every, every tissue because every cell, every tissue has their own uh, requirements, but you can apply that for um, for many different uh, cancers and organs and, uh, and um, mouse engineering as well. Okay, wonderful. Well, that was all fascinating. We already see some thank yous in the chat <laughs> uh, from, from folks who've attended. And um, I, I want to thank you for joining us, Dr. Santos. And I, I really think that uh, this is just like a, a fascinating topic. We don't always hear of some of these connections and understand exactly how you would go about studying them. Uh, and I hope that for those uh, students and also teachers that you got something out of it. And I see some other thank yous coming in. And I hope that you'll all join us uh, for the next one of these, uh, which is like I mentioned before, gonna be on January 13th. So after all of the holidays and breaks. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you again, Dr. DeSantos. We really appreciate right. it. And thank we hope everybody has a wonderful evening and maybe even goes and looks up some more of this information because it was really, really fascinating to, to hear from you. Awesome. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.